Same. Uh, yeah, the usual. Marvin Zindler drops a roach in his coffee. Poison grits? Bacon? Uh, you want more coffee? Yes, please. Yeah. And Hewlett Packard has spun off some of their companies. Comic book superheroes. Just to see if you're paying attention. <laughs> Throughout the history of Bel Air, one constant has united its citizens, a strong sense of community. Residents cherish their connection to neighbors and neighborhood places and institutions. It sets Bel Air apart in the sprawling environs of Houston and was central to the dream that created the city at the turn of the 20th century. William Wright Baldwin was that dreamer. A vice president of the Burlington Railroad, he envisioned great potential for this bald prairie located six miles southwest of Houston. On December 1, 1908, he formed the South End Land Company and purchased 9,700 acres of the 23,000-acre Rice Ranch. 3,000 acres were marketed as small farm lots and named Westmoreland Farms. Early brochures extolled the land's suitability for raising oranges, figs, and strawberries. The rest was to be the new town of Bel Air, named after Bel Air, Ohio, a community served by Baldwin's Railroad. Bel Air's original city limits were bounded by Palmetto, First, Jessamine, and Ferris. In 1909, only a modest country road passed through Bel Air, so Baldwin constructed a grand boulevard from Houston. Bel Air Boulevard was two-laned and shell-paved with a broad center esplanade. A team of South End real estate agents, including A.A. A. Buxton and A.J. Condit, began to sell 50 by 135-foot lots for $250 each. They had no trouble observing their early inventory of 12 homes, as the view westward from their downtown Houston office was unobstructed by trees. Promoting Bel Air was also aided with florid brochures that promised artesian water, superior drainage, and summer temperatures 10 degrees cooler than Houston. For purposes of Bel Air, because Baldwin was from Iowa and the Midwest, uh, his uh, focus was to attract Midwestern settlers to come to Bel Air. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the uh, brochures that were published were focused on uh, the agricultural uh, advantages of Bel Air uh, and the uh, proximity to the city of Houston. In another plan to put Bel Air on the map, Baldwin invited the Wright brothers to use Westmoreland Farms as a demonstration site for their flying machines tour of the U.S. By 1910, a master plan for Bel Air was beginning to take shape. Baldwin invested $150,000 to turn the development into an inviting suburban oasis. Among the team of specialists hired was horticulturist Edward Tease, who had relocated with his family to Bel Air from Missouri to try his hand at growing oranges. His home was one of the first built in Bel Air, and Baldwin appointed Tease to landscape the Bel Air Esplanade he had named Paseo. Mr. Baldwin I asked my grandfather to put a planting down Bel Air from Avenue E to Main Street. He came back a year later and said, where is my planting? And my grandfather said, the cows ate it. And Mr. Baldwin wasn't going to give up easy, so we asked him to plant it again. And so he planted it the second time. Another year when Mr. Baldwin came back, <laughs> he, he couldn't find it again. The cows had eaten it the second time. Another major improvement spearheaded by Baldwin was a trolley line from Houston's Main Street to South Rice Avenue in Bel Air. Its first run commenced on December 24, 1910 and it would operate until 1927. The conductors became well-known members of the community, 
often helping residents with errands by picking up groceries or prescriptions along the line. There were no cars to speak of, and horse and buggy was not very efficient. So the trolley line served as the connection, allowing people to use this area as a country home, but it also transported many of the uh, then residents to schools and to their businesses or to their work in Houston. It was very critical, both to the marketing and to the livability. A beautiful pavilion was constructed on the Esplanade at South Rice Avenue. Not only did it serve as a trolley station, but it also became a community gathering place for picnics, church outings, town elections, and club meetings. On Saturdays during the summer, uh, there were free movies shown uh, adjacent to the, in the area adjacent to the old trolley building. And that was a great uh, experience for the kids. Uh, my brother and I really enjoyed it because they showed a lot of Westerns, which was to our liking at that time. Starting in 1911, Bel Air began adding more amenities. Telephone service was initiated by the Southwestern Telephone and Telegraph Company. Residents Lute and Clarence Anderson built the first Bel Air Light Company and also put in a water system housed at the Bel Air Ice and Water Plant. The first natural gas service was completed to the home of Captain E. H. Buckner on Bel Air Boulevard in 1925. One event that would shape the land of Bel Air and launch a well-known local business occurred in 1912. Edward T.'s dream of raising fruit was about to meet a blue norther. There was thousands of acres of citrus being grown in this area at the time. So he wasn't concerned about how cold it was going to get. But along about 1912 or 13, we had one of those hard freezes, froze out. And he went to the bank, told the banker he didn't have any money to pay him back. And uh, the banker's wife happened to be there, and he said, do you know how to landscape? I said, sure do. He says, well, why don't you landscape our house? We'll network and landscape a lot of houses. You'll be able to pay the bank back. And sure enough, we did. Other public institutions were also finding roots in Bel Air. The first school, built in 1911, was a one-room building with 36 desks on Cedar Street. It still stands today, updated to a residence. The Bel Air School replaced the Cedar Street location and graduated its first class in 1914. Raised well above ground level to avoid flooding, the open bottom floor often sheltered cows from the heat of the day. The building stood on the site of today's Condit Elementary and was named in 1927 after Bel Air resident and South End's real estate agent, A.J. Condit. The law in Bel Air was first enforced by a local constable named Leroy Coates. Coates patrolled the city on foot, bicycle, and horseback and was always accompanied by his pet bulldog, Caesar. His salary was paid by fines imposed on owners of straying cattle a duty that comprised the bulk of his law enforcement activities. We designed a commemorative badge for the Centennial, and uh, we did a lot of research on it. And what we, what we chose, uh, there is a picture of Leroy Coates uh, on horseback with his dog. And if you, if you have a chance to see that picture, what you'll notice is in the background is the, the hood of an old car, probably a Model T. And also in the background is a, is a telephone pole with a single wire on it. So that kind of represents the, the things to come. The first organized church in Bel Air was a mission of First Presbyterian of Houston. Members met in the Bel Air School in 1919 and then built a small church building on 3rd and South Rice, where the modern day church stands today. Another icon of the area was Westmoreland Farm Dairy, founded in 1919. Its milk products and home delivery services would be a part of the community for decades. Of all the events of this era, one of the most transformative was the hurricane of 1915. All the city's greenhouses and a third of all the barns and houses were destroyed. The roof of A.J. Condit's home was blown off, but was rebuilt and continues to stand today. 
If destructive winds were not enough, four years later, a major flood struck the city after 14 consecutive days of rain, a seasonal visitation that would continue to challenge Bel Air in coming years. Well, flooding uh, was, was recognized as an issue from the very beginning. When the streets were laid out, they were laid out at right angles to try to alleviate this. There were also some gigantic drainage ditches built. Uh, but all the money that was spent uh, to alleviate the drainage, to alleviate the flooding, and to promote the town as being safe from flooding didn't really work very well. In spite of these setbacks, Bel Air's 38 citizens were rebuilding and very optimistic about the future. Business endeavors in Bel Air were the next phase of growth. Tees Nursery was founded and sold trees and landscaping plants not only in Bel Air, but also for areas like the Heights, Montrose, Main Street, the San Jacinto Monument, and for much of Rice University. Tees was instrumental in introducing most of the live oaks, white redbuds, catalpas, mulberry, and Chinese tallows that still grace the city today. Lute Anderson, already active with Bel Air's water and electricity, opened the first gas station at the corner of South Rice and Bissonette for the growing number of automobiles being purchased by residents. Leon Rosner, one of the most prolific entrepreneurs in Bel Air, purchased with his father, Louis, the first general store in Bel Air on Cedar. It was owned by C.R. Munger, the city's first full-time mayor. In 1929, Abe Davidson built a brick general store at the eastern intersection of Bel Air and Bissonette. Davidson's store had the first refrigerator case in the city and would also feature a blacksmith and upholstery shop. The building still stands today and continues to house one of Bel Air's oldest businesses, the Bel Air Shoe Repair. The customers are happy that we do a variety of everything. In other words, they tell you, well, can you do this? We say, yes. Can you do that? Yes. You know, and anything they ask us, we do it. And if we don't do it, we will try to get it as close as possible. Tomorrow, I'm 82 years old, so as long as the good Lord lets me go, I'll keep going. Bel Air had its first eatery with the Bel Air Cafe, built in 1934. Across the street was its first drugstore, Finer's. And the first full-service hardware store was established by the Kelly family. It started as a dry goods store run by Minnie Kelly in 1937. Three generations of Kellys ran the store before it finally closed in 1996. Dad would always use, uh, and his people would always use people's customers' names every time then, you know, when they would come in and they knew it. and just. Pretty soon, with the size of Bel Air, and it wasn't too big, you got to just where you almost knew everybody's name that came in there. But that was, that was the, I think, the real key to the success, was just treating people like they were family and waiting on them, uh, and just being sure they got what service they wanted. In 1931, a 38-acre tract in Bel Air was sold to the Houston Congregation of the Incarnate Word and Blessed Sacrament. A convent was erected in 1932, and a boarding school began classes in 1933. Marion High School was added in 1955, and then became Episcopal High School when the convent was sold in 1982 to the Protestant Episcopal Church Council of the Diocese of Texas. The 1940s saw continued growth in population, and there was also new growth in businesses and city services. In 1945, Leon Rosner built the first standalone post office building. Prior to this, mail had been dispensed from a variety of grocery stores in the city. Home delivery started in 1947, but not before an important change in city organization took place. Street addresses. Well, when I went to work in the post office, there were two people working in the post office, uh, Leon Rosner and Del Amos. Mr. Rosner was the postmaster, and I came in as a clerk. 
and uh, Mr. Rosner had already set up and had approval that we were going to start city delivery service in Bel Air on January the 2nd, I guess it was. And then uh, Amos and I would spend a lot of time on the streets trying to get people to get addresses on their houses, to get mailboxes on their doors so that we could uh, start delivery 1st of January. On the northeastern border of Bel Air, land was still undeveloped, save for a riding stable. But this stable would bring worldwide attention to the city. The Pin Oak Charity Horse Show debuted on May 26, 1945, with proceeds given to Texas Children's Hospital. This annual event became the social event of the season. For many years, tickets for Pin Oak were harder to come by than passes to the Kentucky Derby. Leon Rosner was also becoming Bel Air's largest commercial builder, and in 1947, he erected the complex of retail buildings that still stands on the city block south of Bissonette and east of South Rice. Nearby, on Cedar, the first city barbershop was setting up business. It was run by a colorful character named Leon Frenchy Moreau. Frenchy would often ride his horse to work and tie it up to graze on nearby pasture land. Harry Bonin was the second barber hired by Frenchy, and amazingly, still cuts hair at the shop on Cedar today. His customers often span several generations of the same family. Well, how old are you? Uh, I, I'm 90. You're 90, yeah? See, I went into service if you're in World War II. You're 90 years old, and you're good. We had seven barbers on Saturday. A busy Saturday would be that People would come in and with so many people would give them a ticket, they could leave and go shop, and if they came back before their number was called, we'd take them. And uh, I had two barbers there that would cut over 100 head of hair, and I would cut anywhere from 70 to 80, and I was cashier for all seven barbers. City government was maturing as well. Four-term mayor Abe Zindler, father of Marvin Zindler, oversaw a large expansion of municipal construction and new services from 1937 to 1947. A new water plant and water tower was built. Street paving was increased. A new city hall, community building, and recreational facilities were added. The fire department was also growing. It had been organized back in 1931 when the city created a fire prevention board and appointed Lute Anderson as fire marshal. In 1935, the department had one converted Pierce Arrow touring car and an 18-man volunteer force. The fire station was where Volvo's or us is now, and it was a, uh, I guess it was a lean-to attached to a building where they parked the trucks. There was not a dispatcher at that time, so they all called to the house that was across the street from the fire station, and the, the woman of the house would ring the alarm, and they would all come running, and find out where the fire was, and then grab the trucks and take off and go. By 1938, Bel Air had built a new fire station on Jessamine and purchased its first pumper truck. It would not become a paid department until 1952, but even today, Bel Air maintains a volunteer corps of firemen, all from the Bel Air community. It's a calling, and it is a calling where we can do something that can make somebody's life change in a moment's notice. And if we can always keep that in focus and take that and, and pass that on to the people who are replacing us, then it, uh, you pass on much more than a job skill. You pass on a bit of humanity that I think is really important. Also of special note during Mayor Zindler's four terms was Bel Air's implementation of its first zoning ordinance in 1939 a decision that deeply influenced future growth in Bel Air. The first battle, however, caught everyone by surprise. The end of World War II, 1945, West University Place, out of the blue, because it too was looking at growth, as was Houston, passed eight ordinances to annex Southside Place and Bel Air and others, and those cities were outraged, totally taken by surprise. December. 31, 1945. West University Place, though, told Bel Air that 
we really think you should go along with this. It's in your self-interest to do this because we need to have a city separate from Houston. And they even went so far as to suggest that if you go along with this, we'll even rename the new city Bel Air. We'll call the whole thing Bel Air. It went through the courts, but by 1947, West University citizens who weren't terribly pleased with this effort by their council replaced that council in an election and immediately withdrew and rescinded those ordinances. But the war for Bel Air was not over. In 1949, Bel Air voted to become a home rule city. This gave it, among other things, the right of annexation by ordinance. On December 31, 1949, while the newly incorporated Bel Air was preparing to annex land to grow and square off its borders, the city of Houston annexed land on three sides of Bel Air, effectively landlocking it forever. One result of these battles was to spur more citizen involvement in the city. In 1949, the Bel Air Women's Civic Club was organized to contribute to the quality of life in Bel Air. The Bel Air Women's Civic Club was the only women's civic club at that time in the United States. And our object was to help the city, the library, the police station, the fire department, and we contributed thousands and thousands of dollars to those projects. The club was instrumental in starting the first library in Bel Air, then housed in the community center, and then donated money for a permanent building in 1962. Its work would support dozens of initiatives over the years, including city beautification, scholarship programs for Bel Air students, and making sure the police and fire department